Hello, and welcome to Baltic Ways, a podcast bringing you interviews and insights from the world of Baltic studies. I'm your host, Dr. Indra Ekmanis. Today, we listen to a conversation with Dr. Janet Laidla, lecturer in Estonian history at the University of Tartu. Dr. Laidla's recent research has focused on the history of women at the university and the essential roles they have played in both academic and non-academic work. Stay tuned. Thank you so much for joining us on Baltic Ways. Perhaps you can start with a bit about your background and how you came to be involved in Baltic studies. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's it's a bit of a long story, so bear with me because I have a bit of an an unconventional academic career path. Uh, It started out conventional enough. So I did my BA and MA in history at the University of Tartu in Estonia. And then right after, went straight to PhD also in history, also at the University of Tartu. But on my fourth year of PhD in early modern chronicles, I got a bit stuck. So instead of graduating, I went out to look for a job. And eventually I was hired by the University of Tartu Museum. And there I worked in different positions. And for several years, I was the head of old observatory. I enjoyed that a lot. Uh, But instead of history, I was promoting astronomy for 10 years. And my research was more concentrated on history of science than history of 17th century chronicles. I still had a small position at the Institute of History and Archaeology as lecturer. And although I always planned to defend my PhD eventually, I got around to it when the university changed the rules and said, you now have to have a PhD to be a lecturer. Uh, But as I said, my focus had already changed. So after graduating, I was moving slowly at first towards the 20th century. And because I had been working on early modern period, I now also had to seek out new networks. And I had been aware through a lot of my colleagues of the Association for the Advancement of Baltic Studies. But well, a few years ago, I decided now, now it's time because I was working in similar topics that my colleagues who were members were now working on. Yeah, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that transition from studying early modern historiography, and then you went into history of astronomy and sciences. And now I think your focus is on studying women in academia. Perhaps you can chart that path for us a little bit. Well, uh, the University Museum is not only about history of science, it was also about the history of university. And I had been interested in the history of university, especially women students for a while, as specifically the period of the 1920s and the 30s, the interwar period. And for the university centenary in 2019, where we celebrated the 100 years of Estonian language university, We were preparing an exhibition at the National Archives on academic women. And we were so surprised that there was so little research on that subject. So basically, this is how I ended up with the topic that I'm really passionate about. However, my first research paper I did on my first year of university was actually on the position of women in... uh, Greek society. So in a way, I was going back to the roots. (laughs) Um, A full circle sort of a journey then. Well, can you tell us a little bit about your current work, looking at women studying and working at the University of Tartu? Um, You mentioned that you started looking at the interwar period. Maybe you can tell us a bit about the role of the university during those first years of the Estonian Republic and how it kind of developed and how it came to admit women also into different fields of study? So the University of Tartu has a long and illustrious history going back, well, almost 400 years. Yeah. Uh, so it already played a role in the national awakening in the 19th century of Estonian and also Latvian and many other nations of the Russian Empire. 
And of course, it was important for the Young Republic. Its official name was the University of Tartu of the Republic of Estonia. So the state was literally in the name. Yeah. Also, there was the political decision to change the language of instruction to Estonian that we celebrated. So Estonian at the time was not a language of scholarly use. Mm -hmm. and the secondary education had mostly been in German or Russian. And so the university was tasked alongside other organizations to create the vocabulary needed for research. And the university also concentrated on Estonian culture, Estonian history, literature, but also Estonian geography and nature and natural resources instead of like the whole Russian empire or the world. It was not as provincial as it sounds, of course. There were still world-renowned scholars like Ernst and Arminöpik, uh, Ludwig Busep, uh, Johan Willip, uh, Walter Andersson and others. But when we talk about women, women had been admitted as auditors since 1905 and full students since 1915, which is much later than in the US or the UK, for example. But in the Russian Empire and also, in fact, Germany, the struggle for female higher education had been going on over the 19th century. Many women also from Estonia went to Switzerland and there were the higher courses in Tartu, but also in, in St. Petersburg and Moscow. And some of them are kind of like women's colleges, but this is like a topic that I plan to have a closer look in the future. So the university in 1919 did not reverse the decision to admit women. So it was already admitting women. It had been admitting women for, for some years already. And I think it would have been an unpopular decision if they had decided to no longer admit women, but I mean, not everybody was in favor as well. It was like not 100% that all the male academics were like, yes, let all those women come in. Yeah. Um, yeah. And well, maybe you can share then a little bit about how the career paths of women in these academic positions at University of Tartu evolved over time, some of the trends that you saw. So even before you had some women in working in, as assistants in the university clinics or assist, assistants as, at the Astronomical Observatory, Maria Arlova, for example. But in 1919, they started with sort of temporary lecture of English. She was called Jenny or Jenny Ledig. And she had been appointed already in 1905, but then the state said, the government said, no, no women in academia, in, in the staff positions. I mean, we don't even have them as students. So what were you thinking? But so in 1919, you had Jenny Ledig. You had some assistants in the clinics. And there was this young woman, Lydia Boskadis, who also applied to become an assistant in uh, first, she was working at the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, but then sort of moved into medicine. And over the period of the, of the 1920s and the 30s, you could say that the number of, and the percentage of female staff grew steadily. By 1938, it was around 16% of the whole staff. That includes all of the clerical, the secretary positions, and the libraries and so on. But we can say that perhaps around 13% of the th staff were sort of doing at least some research and teaching. Mm -hmm. And over time, some women rose from junior to senior assistants. Uh, the first uh, woman to be invited uh, to become a professor was in uh, 1939. She was, however, not appointed again by the state for different reasons. Gender had probably less to do with it. So Alma Domingos basically became the first auxiliary professor in 1940, and she was a pharmacologist. Mm -hmm. In your work, you also speak a little bit about the challenges facing women in their career progression. Those challenges, one being dealing, you know, kind of with gender and a patriarchal society, but also 
other social and economic and political factors. Can you tell us a little bit about those and their impact on women um, at the University of Tartu? Basically, it was as complicated as it is now, <laughs> in a sense. Um, they're part of the society still, so women's place at home. Uh, single women and also men in Estonia uh, in the marriageable age were frowned upon. In, in terms of coming into the university? <laughs> well, sort of basically coming to, to university because uh, either you were there to find a husband or you were there to sit in a cafe and, you know, waste your life. And also the fear that if you had a higher education, you would not marry because that myth stayed around <laughs> for a quite a bit of time. Um, however, there were still sort of many working mothers also mm -hmm. at the university. Uh, so economically, it made sense in many cases that both of the parents worked, except right after the Great Depression, where uh, especially in civil service, only one of the sp spouses was supposed to work. It could be the woman, but of course, more often it was the man. Yeah. So, and also the university, all this apparent progress aside, at the steady rise of women and staff numbers, there is no question of the fact that the university and the state saw research as mainly as main profession because of the graduate research scholarships that are listed in the staff lists were given almost exclusively to men. Uh, Vera Boska Grunta, she was a specialist in social law, is a notable exception. Uh, this, of course, led women to search for alternative opportunities, for example, through the International Council of University Women, Hilda Daba, who worked in the U.S. is, uh, is a very good example. But uh, this also, you know, needs a little bit of a deeper investigation. Um, a lot of women were working in temporary, low-paying positions at the university. And if you see that there's a job opportunity in, say, high school or you can come a barrister or open your own practice in medicine work for a hospital you figure that this will perhaps give me a higher salary but definitely it might give you more financial security uh, but the baltic german women went to have careers in germany so there were a lot of issues at play in here so it was quite sort of complicated and of course, there were stay-at-home moms and wives. It's just that I'm interested in professional women. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, can you speak a little bit more about these sorts of non-academic roles that women held um, and how they kind of played into the overall culture at the university? Yeah, in this, interestingly, women had worked for the university long before they were admitted as students. Yeah. Uh, from the first part of the 19th century, you had the midwives uh, working mm -hmm. at the, for the university. From the second part, you had the housekeepers at clinics. You had the first secretaries. And the beginning of the 20th century, as I mentioned, the assistants at the astronomical observatory and the clinics. In the 1920s and 30s, there were also a lot of women working as secretaries uh, in the offices also at different libraries and with collections. And some of these women working, especially in the collections, might have also pursued research and they also could have done some teaching. I think the archaeologist Marta Schmiedehelm is a good example of this. So in my opinion, the line between academic and non-academic is blurred. And this is why I don't want to dismiss uh, the non-academic positions from my research as many of uh, of other scholars have done. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the work and the history of women at the university extending far beyond kind of what we think of as formal academic roles. That's an important point to make. I wonder if you can tell us about the overall situation and some of the key takeaways that you're finding in your research um, or areas perhaps that you want to continue to explore. Well, um, some of the things that I have found from my study of the University of Tartu during the interwar period, when I sort of engaged them with the previous research on the subject done in the US, uh, the UK, and uh, Germany, 
Then in some places, the women were engaged in the so-called feminine fields, such mm -hmm. as home economics, for example. Yeah. Uh, but in Tartu, there were no clearly defined feminine fields because uh, they did not have the home economics department for starts. But there are definitely non-female fields. So the faculties of theology, agriculture, and law were dominantly, if not exclusively, male fields. Yeah. Uh, so women were more numerous in the faculties of medicine, veterinary medicine, mathematics, and natural sciences. But it's sort of interesting because I think that the um, the factor here is also the the hierarchy, like how many levels of positions you have. For example, in humanities, you have lecturers, docents, and professors. So in humanities, women only have the lower positions, at least until 1939. But in these other areas where you have like the temporary assistants and junior assistants, senior assistant, docent, if you have more layers, then you actually can see women sort of starting from the bottom and going up. Of course, men also start from the bottom and, and go up. And sometimes they linger in the lower positions and sometimes they are similarly demoted or leave the university. So I think that I need to do some more data analysis to really understand how the sort of the restructuring or the structure or the hierarchy of the position works for women at the time and perhaps how it works for women now, also the preliminary survey of the social status also suggests a more varied social background for the academic women in Estonia in comparison to some other Western European countries. Several are indeed from lower and upper middle class, but there are also a fair number of working class women and farmers' daughters. Now, farmers' daughters, there is a range, so they could be quite wealthy in Estonia or relatively yeah. poor. So there's other factors as well. And in many places, marriage ended the academic career. So academic women were single, but there is a significant number of married couples working at the universities, such as Elfrida and Wilhelm Ridala, Elisa Gergingisse and Georgingisse, Gerhard and Natalia Rago, Salma and Irma Vorama, and so on. Many others were also married, just not to fellow academics, including Lydia Boskades that I mentioned earlier. And of course, there are fathers and daughters. So we get to mothers and daughters only in the 1940s. That said, there are several women students who remember being told that if they are serious about their research, they should not marry. One by Professor Gustav Suits whose wife, Aina, worked at the university as a lecturer for over 15 years. Oh, a bit ironic then. Yeah, sort of. I, I know that this discussion took place before Aina took up the position of lecturer. So maybe he changed his mind when he, because Aina was also like a mother. She was a working mother. They had the sort of children. And so she had to somehow cope with, uh, with everything. Yeah, um, it's interesting that you talk about this kind of range of economic backgrounds with the women who entered into these roles. Do you have any inclination as to why there is that that type of access, that, that range? So I think it has something to do with Estonia being the young republic that sort of, sort of declared itself uh, classless or, or where class wasn't as, as prominent. Also for many of these women, the secondary education and also the university education was a way of social mobility and um, they were out there to get a job because the university education was costly and they thought that it would be an easier way uh, to work for the university while studying at the university. So they sometimes weren't motivated so much by the sort of idea of an academic career. They didn't see it as um, as entering academia, as perhaps we sometimes do now, that that you are have this uh, career path uh, ahead of you. It was just the job as, as many other. But I would need to sort of, as I said, this was a preliminary study and I would need to sort of 
go further in order to make any kind of more profound <laughs> arguments based on this. But it, but, but it was interesting to see, it. Uh, but it was also expected thinking about the Estonian history and what the uh, Estonian states at least sort of declared in the beginning it was uh, about to do. So, yeah, I think that was that was one of the things that uh, perhaps makes the Estonian state and probably some other uh, similar case studies stand out on the background of the Western European situation. Yeah, um, I wonder what you think of all this work that you're doing, this study of the interwar period. How do you think it kind of translates into today? How, how can it impact the way that we are thinking about women? in academia now. You know, I'm thinking a little bit about um, a study that I recently read about the United States where there are this kind of fears of a quote-unquote demographic crisis regarding too many women in comparatively in academia. The, the argument was that there, there's not necessarily a balance anymore. And I wonder what it's like in Estonia and at the same time, you know, uh, keeping in the back of our mind that there are uh, a plenty of areas where we are not uh, seeing parity or, or, or equity. So i uh, curious in, uh, about your thoughts on that. Well, it's a, also a complex issue. Um, yes, I actually heard that argument recently when we had the sort of Women in Science Day. Some, uh, one of the discussants was sort of saying that soon we will be talking about the lack of men in, in university, so they will become a minority. Uh, not yet in Estonia. Of course, things have changed where in, you know, 1940, we had one professor yeah. and now we have around 30% of uh, professors at the University of Tartu are women. So sort of we're getting <laughs> closer to balance. Sort of thinking about recent research, uh, Michelle Ryan uh, wrote a, uh, a paper in Nature in 2022 saying that one of the misconceptions we have is that we overestimate uh, the progress. So perhaps yeah. <laughs> perhaps it was based on statistics, perhaps it was another overestimation of the, of the yeah. representation of women. And I'm thinking perhaps partly we underestimate the number of women working at the university in the past. So we overestimate now because we think that there has been this huge progress. Yeah. And then you might say and that, yes, that's the numbers, but their positions and their contributions in comparison today were insignificant. But nowadays we understand research much more as teamwork, as a collaborative mm -hmm. effort. So perhaps they're the women of the past, their uh, contributions were not as insignificant. So, I mean, the records did not file themselves. The notes and manuscripts did not type themselves at the sure. time. And we also know these later con controversies concerning, for example, Rosalind Franklin or Jocelyn Bell Burnell. And I'm not saying that we'll find something like that in here in Tartu as well, but, but still... And well, coming back to the sort of the overestimation or the sort of the, the fact that women are becoming dominant, that there's a fear that women might start to dominate academia at some, well, it then tells you something about academia oh. because the IT sector used to be a female area in the beginning. Because the computers, and it all started from the universities. It's, it started from the Harvard University where the computations and also the glass uh, plates, uh, the astrographs uh, were making were analyzed by a group of women called so the Pickering Harem. And also Tartu had its own, its own set of women computers. And they were called mm -hmm. computers, yeah. basically. And so it's the whole, the hidden figure story at, uh, yeah. and NASA and so on. So in the beginning, these sort of computer programs and computing, well, not in the beginning, but at some point, this was women's work. And then it started to pay something. It started to be prominent. It started to be, you know, the salaries got higher. And then for some reason, it became like sort of dominantly male field. And now we're looking for to include women in, well, STEM, but also IT, basically. So maybe we should do some soul searching and see if yeah. the 
uh, if the working positions in academia are, are then not highly paid or prestigious enough that men are no longer interested. So it's not about sort of women taking over only. It's also what I see when I look at professional women is that they are often stuck into low prestige, low paying jobs. So if, you know, if they're overflowing the academia, it's, it says something about academia in the future, but well, at least in Tartu, where uh, a, a fair bit to weigh to that. And it, it's also sort of about numbers. It's another thing that Michelle Ryan said that it's, it's not the percentage of stuff. You have to look at the positions. And I mean, are the sort of the heads of, you know, these uh, Ivy League <laughs> universities and colleges, you know, the top positions, are they being <laughs> taken over massively by women? Or is, is it just that you have women in, you know, the administrative positions, the low paying, the teaching positions? Is the sort of the overall percentage more than 50 or, or are you having women in the higher positions? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And you speak really well to to that idea of those hierarchies and also the the unrecognized labor that really does support broader academic achievement, filing, typing, being a sounding board. It is important and significant um, to recognize that that labor as well. Perhaps you can tell tell us a little bit more about the future um, of your work. Yes. So the Tartu example is uh, very interesting. And also there is a lot of material because um, the University of Tartu uh, collected masses of information on its students and stuff. So much more than many other institutions around the world. Uh, so you can do different things with the material. But I would also like to do some comparative history. For example, Zana Rosita is doing similar studies for her PhD at the University of Latvia. But I am looking to, so it's interesting to compare the Tartu case with Latvia because they are so close. But um, I'm also looking to compare my Tartu case with the universities in Finland, New Zealand and Australia. And now you might be wondering why these countries well, the obvious factor, of course, is the early vote for women, but the, also the size of population, the number of universities, the empire factor is also there. And in a way, all four countries trying somehow to redefine themselves before the Second World War, uh, two of them becoming independent and two of them sort of becoming definitely more autonomous within the empire. So I think... It would be interesting to compare these. I, I don't think many people would agree Estonia and Finland in, as being a frontier in the 20th century, but, but somehow sort of these frontier co-educational institutions in these, in these four countries to see what else comes out from this comparison. Yeah, and, and we will certainly look forward to seeing the results of that future work from you as well. You know, this has been such a fascinating discussion, and I think it's such an interesting and significant topic. It's really necessary to understand our histories, the histories of our institutions, the role um, of women throughout the course of those institutions, which has so often been undervalued or understudied at the very least. And this is making, making a significant contribution to that work, so I appreciate the discussion very much especially in, in kind of this time where we're seeing slow and incremental but still important progress. I often think of, of the Baltics as one of those key regions that advances the visibility of women in sort of leadership positions, thinking very much um, uh, about those kind of strong women, Kaya Kalas, Vajrovic Freiberg, Dalia Gribuskaita. And so it's interesting to have this perspective as well. Yes, because sort of we assume that uh, the position of women, especially in the 20th century, has been linearly uh, sort of progressive, but it hasn't actually. Also in academia, it hasn't. And there is a PhD thesis on the University of Washington in the US, for example, where she starts out in the 19th century and ends in, I think, 1970s. And she so shows how it, it has been up and down. 
it yeah. hasn't been this linear progress that I'm showing in, in Tartu. The, the fact that it's linear is, is really interesting. Um, but of course, in Estonia, there's a different kind of sort of this break uh, in the 1940s and this apparent understanding that in the Soviet Union, the gender question had been solved. And I don't know if I'll really go into the, in the Soviet period as well, but well, it isn't as easy as that, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. So it's, if, even if we are making pro progress at the moment, I think, especially in, in the US, you are feeling that uh, when women's rights in general are <laughs> in question, and then it's definitely sort of, if you have reached some level, it's not, yes, we can all only go forward from here. No, you yeah. can actually go back. Yeah, I think it's something that needs to be sort of kept in, you know, mind that uh, every victory we have won is not, you know, certain. Mm. It is certainly um, not a guarantee for for that progress to be linear. That's that's such an important point. Well, again, I am so thankful for the opportunity to be in discussion with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lydloff, for joining us um, on the podcast. We certainly look forward uh, to your future work. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in to Baltic Ways, a podcast from the Association for the Advancement of Baltic Studies, produced in partnership with the Baltic Initiative at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. A note that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of AABS or FPRI. I'm your host, Indra Eklis. Subscribe to our newsletters at aabs-balticstudies.org and fpri.org slash baltic-initiative for more from the world of Baltic studies. Thanks for listening and see you next time.